First, I would like to congratulate all the past and present members of the Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada on the 40th anniversary of the founding of the organization in 1982, a long time ago. However, I'm honored to have been asked to provide insights into 40 years of progress in medical treatment, surgery, and surgical education. As a neurosurgeon over these 40 years, I've had an ability to assess a time period before the MR scanner, and in fact, as a resident before the CT scanner, and I've seen a remarkable change in the ability to treat patients with brain tumors. However, during these 40 years, there's been a substantial role of physicians, researchers, nurses, healthcare providers, and especially patients, especially patients in moving the field forward. I would particularly like to thank these patients for all they have done. The goals of this present are to outline the importance of brain tumor banking in the present assessment of tumors, and in the personalized treatment of brain tumors, to outline progress in the surgical treatment of brain tumors, and also to outline developments in the field of simulation in neurosurgical education, and the role in the evolution of the future operating room. The vision of the Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada is to define the cause of and a cure for brain tumors, while improving the quality of life for those affected. Therefore, research is a key to achieving this vision. The first thing I would like to discuss is brain tumor tissue banking. And the reason for that is the Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada, since 1991, has funded a brain tumor tissue bank in London, Ontario. Well, why is a brain tumor tissue bank important? Well, first, how does it work? Well, what, it, what happens is that at the time of operation, as you can see here, brain tumor tissue is removed, is placed in specific vials associated with blood and other tissues, and then it's brought to a specific brain tumor tissue bank. In that brain tumor tissue bank, tissue is divided up and stored at minus 80 degrees sonograde in specific sort of containers. The storage can occur for multiple decades. The importance of a bank is the interest. And the interest of a brain tumor tissue bank is the possibility that these tissues that have been stored in the bank can be sent to any researcher throughout the world who has a particular project that involves that type of tumor. Many brain tumors are relatively rare and having the ability of multiple tissue banks throughout the world to provide tissue for tissue banks and therefore provide tissue for researchers to do their research is a very important component of the present, the past and the future. The other thing I would like to, to suggest to patients who are being operated on and have the potential and ability to have some of their tissue placed in a brain tumor tissue bank to do so. The reason being that that will help them, help other patients who have their type of tumor and help the whole sort of system of understanding how brain tumors occur, what is their cause and help with the finding cures. To give you an example of why banking is important, Studies carried out at Western University in London, Ontario, utilized tissue from the brain tumor bank and demonstrated that a particular type of tumor that derived from oligo oligogliomal types of cells were sensitive to specific drugs. Results demonstrated that patients harboring tumors histologically identified as these 
anaplastic oligodendroglyomas had a very specific loss of a part of the first chromosome and the 19th chromosome in their tumor, nowhere else in their body, but in that tumor itself. And what that meant was when these particular patients were assessed, these patients had a longer response to drug therapy and lived much longer. These results also demonstrated that molecular genetic analysis of an individual patient's tumor would play a critical role in determining treatment as well as prognosis and was one of the major breakthroughs that occurred related to brain tumors. Second, at the present time, all clinical trials that are associated with brain tumors, there is an attempt to stratify, in other words, to divide patients into patients that have specific types of genetic abnormalities to try to find out which particular patients would respond to a particular drug, which may not respond to that drug, and why particular patients will or will not respond. And that's becoming the norm and is moving the whole field forward. To give you an idea, research funded by the Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada has funded a group led by Michael Taylor at the Hospital for Sick Children, along with a very large group called the Medulloblastoma Advanced Genomics International Consortium. And they use tissue from multiple tissue banks to identify four specific subgroups of medulloblastoma. Medulloblastoma is one of the more common if, of brain tumors in children. In a consensus statement, what they basically feel is, and is now true, is with the ability to sequence patients' tumors, in, which is now less expensive. It's now widely available in many centers. This information has allowed us to develop and identify four different subgroups of medulloblastoma, for example. And why that's important is because each of these subgroups have a very specific difference in the changes in their tumor related to the genetics. And therefore, if we know that that particular patient has a specific type of genetic abnormality in that particular tumor that they have, one can focus the drug treatment on trying to deal with that particular type of genetic abnormality rather than giving patients drugs that may not be very effective. And this is what the future of treatment is going to be in both adults and in children in the future. In the early 2000s, work done by Roger Stoop and uh, Monica Helge demonstrated that temozolomide was effective in the treatment of certain types of glioma-based tumors, glioblastoma multiforme being one of them. And Hickey was able to identify that a specific gene manipulation that occurs in these tumors is associated with those patients responding much better to temozolomide than others. And again, this is one of the ways in which understanding what the genetics of your particular tumor may be can help us determine the best way of treating your tumor. So what has happened there? So what we can do now is we can look, for example, we can extract the DNA from that from the tumor. We can begin to understand what the actual genetic abnormalities are in your particular tumor. And then there's a whole group of particular genes that can be assessed to see if they are abnormal or normal in a particular tumor. And this is allowing us to really more carefully define what exactly is a tumor. So it's not gonna be so much defining what the tumor looks like under the microscope, but actually defining what are the actual genetic changes that are present in that particular tumor and how are we gonna use that information to help patients in the future. And this is what's been called personalized and precision medicine. What does this mean? Well, the first thing, if you look up here in the corner, we can use the patient's own cells to identify what the genetic changes are. We can then sort of understand what is that particular tumor's genetic change and how does that link with other patients that have had that genetic change in the past. We can predict whether or not that particular tumor may or may not respond to a particular medication or how well it will respond. And then we can begin to think about how do we assess that patient's response? 
in multiple different ways. In other words, after using one particular drug, should we then try another drug based on the genetics? How should we sequence the drugs that are used based on the genetics? And this is the whole idea of personalized medicine, medicine that's actually personalized to the individual, to that particular tumor that that particular individual has, not just to the diagnosis, but to that, those particular abnormalities that are present in the tumor. And this really is the whole idea of precision medicine and precision types of uh, treatment. And it will clearly advance the treatment of tumors. It's advancing the treatment of tumors and many other types of tumors throughout the body. And the hope is that this particular information will also make a significant contribution and is making a significant contribution at the present time to patients that have specific types of tumors with specific types of genetic abnormalities in that particular tumor that the patient has. Now, the second thing that I want to talk a little bit about today is the idea of precision, precision personalized surgery. Well, what does that mean? Well, the present time, what we, we, we can do is we can identify, for example, as you can see here in the slide, where a tumor is within the brain using MR technology and other types of technology. We can also identify how close that tumor is to specific areas of the brain that are very important for that patient to function. Areas, for example, that may involve your motor function, your speech function, your ability to, to deal with various complex problems. And we can identify them in reconstructions of the brain and we can identify them on MR scanning. And then in the upper room, as you can see here, you can identify where the tumor is. You can see it outlined here in yellow. And you can also identify where this important area is. This particular area had, was associated with being able to identify how things move in different directions, three-dimensional uh, areas that are involved in the sort of intellectual construction of how you do each day's work and uh, survive in each day's sort of environment. And therefore you can take out the tumor and leave this particular area alone because you identified it and it can actually project it onto the brain before the operation. And then during the operation, you can, you can actually be involved in that process of understanding where the tumor is and where the important parts of the brain are around the tumor. MR, second, one can deal with things like interoperative MR scanning, Robotics is moving forward and is going to be a component of the treatment of tumors in the future. And weight craniotomies have also been utilized much more uh, over the last number of years than before, just because we can get so much information about what's happening related to the tumor before the operation. In other words, where the tumor is, what is very close to the tumor, and what approaches should be used get at that particular tumor. And we can then have a patient awake and remove the tumor while the patient is awake to make sure that we don't cause any significant injury to the patient. The real concept now has come on to safe, precision, personalized surgery. And that's gonna to continue to move forward as we get more and more technology into the upper room. The next thing I would like to sort of move ahead with, basically because it links to what I've just talked about, technology and more linkages, is the idea of surgical education using virtual reality brain tumor simulations. You can see here on the right, this is what, this is what a simulation looks like. In other words, here is the individual actually operating on a simulated brain tumor. Well, what, what does that mean? Well, in 2008 and through 2012, the National Research Council of Canada really collaborated with physicians from teaching hospitals in Canada and around the world to develop what's now called the virtual, uh, the, uh, virtual VR or the neuro VR. It's presently the most advanced virtual simulator in the world. And this just gives you a little bit of an idea of how these particular systems work. You can see here that the individual is using instruments to operate on the brain tumor that you can see in the middle, which is bleeding. And you can see here that it's all virtual. It's completely virtual. Why is it important? Well, the reason it's important is 
what's happened in the past is the first time that a student is able to operate related to brain tumors use involves actually operating on a patient that has a brain tumor. And therefore there are certain risks associated with that. So one of the uh, abilities one has doing virtual reality training is to train individuals on virtual reality systems way before they actually operate on a human. And this virtual reality training, as you can see here on the left, one basically can, the student can do a particular operative procedure. That individual gets marks on how they're doing the operative procedure. We can get information on all the forces that are applied, how much of the tumor is, has been able to be removed. And that can give the, the individual tailored feedback. In other words, the individual can learn immediately while during the tumor, how well he's doing and how to improve his function. At the present time, artificial intelligence is being used in these systems. So what the artificial intelligence system can do, it actually can begin the process of actually training the student to do the operation safely. In that particular aspect of artificial intelligence, virtual reality, and all the new technologies that we have available are soon going to allow us to be able to not only train individuals, but assess how well they're able to do operations and help them progress in a much quicker way in learning the techniques associated with complex surgical procedures. And one of the things that we can also do that has been funded by the Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada, along with the trying to find out the best way of training surgeons, is the future is going to involve you're getting an image of that person's brain tumor. That particular image is constructed into a three-dimensional image with the brain tumor inside of it. And the surgeon and the trainees can actually operate on the patient's tumor in this virtual reality world before, before they actually take the patient to the upper room. So this is sort of uh, the sort of new ideas that are being developed related to using neurosurgical virtual reality simulation, artificial intelligence, and the combining of all these technologies we have to try to improve the quality of surgery. So in essence, what we'd like to do is combine all the technologies we have about genetics, surgery, simulation, and put all of these technologies together to improve the overall quality of treatment, surgical treatment, and other treatment associated with um, our ability to improve patient outcomes. So what is the future going to look like? Well, I'm just going to show you a few sort of scientific type of future. Phase lock 99%, think it's stable. I have the first congruency. Now this is a futuristic look of what the operating room is going to look like, but I think it's not that far from reality. The future of the operating room is going to be a much more complex place. It's going to involve being able to get information uh, related to the preoperative information of the patient's tumor, the important areas around the tumor, and then doing everything we can in the, during the operation to make the procedure as safe as we possibly can. So in summary, surgery, <coughs> medical care, and post-operative care. In other words, all of these components of surgery involving all these areas are critical components of the vision of the Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada. Brain tumor banking will continue to play a critical role in helping to develop targeted approaches to treatment. Precise and personalized clinical treatment will play more of a role in the care of brain tumor patients. In other words, this genetic genotyping is going to be critical to the future of brain tumor treatment. Precision personalized surgery, utilizing continually evolving technology, including virtual reality, artificial intelligence, will increase the safety and effectiveness of operative procedures. And simulation and artificial intelligence will develop further to, to increase and improve surgical education and the surgical care in patient outcomes. 
I would very much like to thank Susan Marshall, the Chief Executive Officer of the Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada, and Susan Rikers, who has helped with putting together this particular presentation. The future for brain tumor patients is one of continuing hope related to multiple advances that are occurring in the area of genetics, surgery, and simulation artificial intelligence. And it would be my hope, using all this information together, that the future of brain tumor patients is continuing to be brighter and brighter, with the hope that one day we will indeed find the cause of brain tumors and we will have a cure. If you have any questions related to this presentation, I'm sure that I will, would be able to at least attempt to provide an answer and the Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada can clearly provide help in many different ways, which include everything from support groups, the handbook, and in particular, having someone to interact with related to your problem. Thank you very much. All the best to you, and I look forward to a improved treatment for everyone that has a brain tumor. Thank you.